Hey ho, did you know that there's a universe in the radio? I'm gonna tell you what you want to know about the universe in the radio. If you look at the sky on a dark night, a night when you can get away from the glow of city lights, you will see a patch of sky so full of stars that the light blends together and looks milky. It's as if the heavens are shielded by a vast, faint cloud. You are looking at the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy. For centuries, humans looked at the night sky and thought Earth was the center of a great sphere. All the stars and planets drifted across the surface of that sphere, across the dome of the Earth, as some people called it. The Milky Way traced a broad line across that dome. If you look closely at the sky, outside the line of the Milky Way, you can see a few fuzzy blobs. Today, we know that our Milky Way galaxy looks a lot like those fuzzy blobs, for telescopes have sharpened our vision. We call some of these blobs spiral galaxies because they have bright, curving arms that wrap around a central point. And we now know that our own galaxy is a spiral, at least when viewed from the top down. When we look at it from the side, it actually looks more like a fried egg, with most of its stars confined to a flat disk and a bulging yolk at the center. But how can we know what our galaxy looks like from the outside if we live in the midst of it? After all, our sun is but one star located on a remote edge of one of the spiral arms. And when we look at the sky, we see the rest of the galaxy from a remote, off-center position. How can we see the forest when we're in the midst of the trees? To uncover our position and place in the universe, astronomers have had to develop a new type of vision. In the last half century, and mainly in the past 30 years, astronomers have discovered new ways to observe the sky. They have found that there is as much to be learned from what they cannot see with their eyes as there is in what they can see. They found the secrets of the galaxy hiding in the invisible light of the Milky Way. a universe in the radio. I'm gonna tell you what you want to know about the universe in the radio. Until the 16th century, most people believed that Earth was the center of the universe. Then, in 1543, Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus challenged this idea. After studying the motion of celestial objects, he asserted that the Sun was at the center of the solar system, and hence the universe. The planets, including Earth, revolved around the Sun, though the ideas of Copernicus were widely shunned at the time. In a sense, they were humanity's first steps off of the Earth. About 50 years later, Galileo Galilei used the newly invented telescope and added to the controversy. Turning his new spyglass toward the skies, he saw four bright objects, moons, orbiting Jupiter. It was spectacular visual proof that not everything in our universe revolved around the Earth. Over time, the development of ever larger telescopes led astronomers farther and farther from our earthly home. To the stars, ooh, I'm leaving today. First, people realized that the stars were much farther from Earth than any of the planets. Then, by the mid 1800s, the best telescopes could resolve some of the fuzzy blobs of light into crisp spiral structures. Astronomers also spied elliptical and irregular shapes. Some started to think that perhaps these fuzzy blobs were stellar systems, separate universes unto themselves. 
As the vast distances to these systems became known, some scientists began calling those separate universes galaxies and counted our Milky Way as one of them. Our sun was at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, they thought. But then in the 1920s, astronomer Harlow Shapley found the real center of our galaxy. First, he determined the distances to many of the globular clusters in the Milky Way. He observed these dense concentrations of up to a million stars apiece outside the thick line of stars in the Milky Way. From the locations of the clusters and their distances from us, Shapley was able to draw a map of the globular clusters, seen here as a three-dimensional model. He determined that the globular clusters were not centered around the sun. They were centered around a point thousands of light years from the sun. Shapley reasoned that since a large mass would be required to keep the globular clusters orbiting around a central point, the center of the clusters must be the center of the galaxy. That is, just as gravity keeps moons circling planets and planets circling the sun, it also keeps star clusters orbiting around the center of the Milky Way. Shapley had found the galaxy center, but the galaxy structure was still to be determined. Astronomers gathered telescopic and photographic observations to try to show that our galaxy had a spiral shape. But their attempts failed. Astronomy hit a brick wall, or rather, impenetrable, dark holes in the heavens. When viewed through telescopes, the galaxy and the universe had places where stars seemed to be missing. These dark holes were perplexing because they could be found in patches of the sky that were otherwise rich with stars. Eventually, scientists surmised that these holes were in fact clouds of dust and gas so thick that they completely blocked out the light from the stars behind them. Such dust obscures our view of most of the Milky Way galaxy. By the middle of the 20th century, telescope observations of visible light had taught us that we are neither the center of the universe nor of our galaxy. Our observations also had revealed that the stars of the Milky Way seemed to arrange themselves in a pancake-like disk with a definite center somewhere distant from our little solar system. Most of all, we learned that there is more to the universe than meets the eye. If we were going to go beyond this, we were going to need another technological innovation. X-rays, gamma rays, high energy. Hot stars, heavy stars, high density. Quasars, black holes, supernovae. Powerhouses lighting up the galaxy. Flashing, bursting, pulsing objects we could see if we had X-ray eyes. If we had X-ray eyes. <laughs> Repeat after me, radio, infrared, visible, UV, keep going all the way, and what do you see? That X-rays, gamma rays, high energy, an X-ray photon has a high frequency, which means a shorter wavelength than you could ever see. In the 19th century, while astronomers were creating bigger and better telescopes, physicists were approaching an understanding of electromagnetic radiation, commonly known as light. What they found would eventually make astronomers' visions broader than they ever thought possible. Only a small portion of the sun's light passes freely through the Earth's atmosphere and reaches the surface. It is interesting, though not surprising, that the light reaching the ground is the portion of the spectrum to which the human eye adapted. We can see light as a range of colors, from violet to deep red, all of which have relatively similar wavelengths. Around 1800, Sir William Herschel discovered that the sun also emits radiation that is invisible to the naked eye. Placing a thermometer in the various color beams dispersed by a prism, Herschel found that the temperature in the region just beyond the visible red was not much different than it was in the visible. This meant that there was some form of light, some kind of radiation where nothing could be seen. Herschel had discovered invisible infrared light. The next year, another fortuitous experiment by J.W. Ritter led to the discovery of invisible ultraviolet light, just beyond the violet end of the spectrum. 
By the end of the 19th century, the full range of electromagnetic radiation had been discovered, including radio waves and X-rays. Most people familiar with these terms don't realize that they refer to different kinds of light. In a manner of speaking, they are colors that our eyes cannot detect. While visible light passes freely through Earth's atmosphere to the surface, most other wavelengths of light are absorbed. Short wavelength X-rays are totally absorbed at high altitudes. A few infrared and ultraviolet wavelengths are able to penetrate the atmosphere, such as the UV rays that give you a sunburn. But the rest are absorbed by the ozone layer and other gases in Earth's atmosphere. Radio waves, which are harmless to humans, also penetrate to the surface. So the light we see with our limited vision is actually just a tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Think of it this way. If the spectrum were a piano keyboard with 60 octaves, the visible colors would span less than one octave. Not exactly a grand range for the cosmic symphony. Think about how much you would gain if you could hear all these octaves. It was 1931 when Dr. Karl Johnski, he's the father of radio astronomy. He studied radio noise to find out what it could be, and saw that it was coming from our own galaxy. In 1931, Karl Jansky, a radio engineer at Bell Labs, was studying how thunderstorms interfered with radio reception. When he turned on his receivers, he heard a lot of static. Some of it could be attributed to nearby thunderstorms, some to more distant storms. But some of the static came from points he could not identify. Eventually, Jansky and colleagues realized that this steady hiss was coming from beyond the solar system. In 1937, Grote Reber, another radio engineer, decided to listen to that cosmic hiss and built a prototype radio telescope in his own backyard. He tuned it to particular radio frequencies and produced maps of the radio emissions in the sky. Reber was the world's only radio astronomer until the end of World War II, when receivers became sensitive enough to detect radio waves from space. After visible light, radio waves are the easiest wavelengths to detect because they can penetrate Earth's atmosphere. Many astronomical objects emit radio waves, with some objects emitting more intense radio waves than visible light. Radio astronomy opened astronomers' eyes to new visions of the universe. Unlike visible and radio light, most infrared light is absorbed by Earth's atmosphere. Only a few narrow wavelength bands can get through. To make matters worse, all the warm objects around us, including the atmosphere and people, emit so much infrared radiation that it overwhelms the faint emissions that arrive from space. The earliest infrared detectors were not sensitive enough to compensate for this, so the field of infrared astronomy couldn't really be launched until rockets could take instruments above Earth's warm and absorbing atmosphere. Similarly, before the 1960s, we knew that the sun was an intense source of X-rays, but our observations of those rays were quite limited. The vacuum of space, however, is ideal for X-ray observations. So when Riccardo Giacconi sent detectors into space by rocket in 1962, he found a bright source of X-rays in the constellation Scorpius. This opened the field of galactic X-ray astronomy. Our field of view had finally widened enough to size up the galaxy. <laughs> There's a lot of cool gas in the Milky Way Neutral hydrogen atoms leading the way When the proton and electron spin decay It's in the really long radio wave away Look again at the visible Milky Way. The Milky Band appears to wrap around the sky. Our panoramic view is from inside the pancake-like disk in a remote corner of the galaxy. Now, let's add images at other wavelengths. When we study these photons day after day to map the regions of the galaxy, rip away. Do, ba, 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 do,
Our tour of the invisible Milky Way galaxy begins with radio observations. This is light with very long wavelengths, shown here in colors we can see. Stars, gas, and dust make up the Milky Way and other galaxies. But at radio wavelengths, we only see the gas. We are seeing concentrations of atomic hydrogen gas. These atoms radiate at a single characteristic wavelength. Astronomers have determined that atomic hydrogen is spread almost evenly throughout the galaxy. Because of its long wavelength, this light passes through the pervasive interstellar dust, enabling us to see the far reaches of the galaxy. The relative motions of gas clouds toward and away from our radio telescopes makes the wavelengths we measure shorter or longer. Because the sizes and directions of these motions form fairly simple patterns, we can tell that the Milky Way is rotating around the galactic center. The gas clouds move like horses on a merry-go-round. Once astronomers understood the galaxy's bulk rotation, they could then work backwards to infer an individual gas cloud's location from its motion. Combining all the available information with light from all regions of the galaxy, astronomers were able to estimate the galaxy's width and depth. The Milky Way is so vast that it takes light moving at 6 trillion miles per year, 100,000 years to cross it. Now we see a map of the radio emissions of carbon monoxide, a tracer of the much more elusive molecular hydrogen. The wavelengths of carbon monoxide are 100 times shorter than those of atomic hydrogen. As we can see, molecular hydrogen clouds are much more clumpy than atomic hydrogen clouds. They are also 100 to 1,000 times denser. We add a map of visible light alongside. This is a mosaic of photographs, with light primarily from stars within a few thousand light years of the sun. In regions where the visible map is dark, the molecular hydrogen map is bright. It was this comparison that allowed astronomers to deduce that gas clouds are laced with dust and the dust blocks visible light. We now know why we cannot see much of the galaxy in visible light. But that is not so important, since we can see to the farthest reaches with the much longer wavelengths of atomic and molecular hydrogen. New stars forming inside molecular clouds heat up the gas and cause it to glow brightly at radio wavelengths. Massive molecular clouds flesh out the spokes of the galaxy's spiral. It's similar to the vision of a city that you get when you fly in an airplane at night. Street lights are bunched along the major roads, so you can trace the layout of a city without necessarily seeing the roads or buildings. Molecular hydrogen clouds clump together along the major structures of our galaxy and make them bright. This allowed astronomers to determine that our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. Almost everything in the universe radiates infrared light. When an object is not hot enough to shine in visible light, it emits the bulk of its energy in infrared wavelengths. For instance, the dust clouds that block visible light actually absorb the starlight, warm up, and then re-radiate the light as infrared. As infrared light is not absorbed by dust or gas clouds, it can pass all the way through the galaxy. Infrared observations are typically split into the near, or shorter wavelength, and far, or longer wavelength. Here, we see observations of far infrared light at three distinct wavelengths. In the first map, we see light from dust grains in interstellar clouds that absorb ultraviolet and visible starlight and emit far infrared light. At slightly shorter wavelengths in the second map, bright regions correspond to warmer dust emission, suggesting that the dust is heated by brighter or hotter stars. At even shorter far infrared wavelengths, we can see starlight shining directly from cool stars and the warmest dust in the interstellar clouds. Now we color the first map red, the second green, and the third map blue. When we lay these maps one on top of the other, we get a composite view of our galaxy in far infrared light. From this, astronomers can infer the relative locations of the bright young stars and the older, cooler stars. 
Imagine a plane, like a sheet of paper, passing through the center of the thin side of the galactic disk, that is, edgewise. This is the galactic plane. The white-hot regions in the galactic plane are regions where young, massive stars are still embedded in the gas clouds from which they formed. Moving away from the plane, we see green regions, where warm dust is heated by somewhat older stars. Farthest away from the plane, we see the reddest regions that contain the coolest dust, heated by older, cooler stars. These observations helped astronomers determine that stars are born in the thin layer of molecular gas clouds concentrated in the galactic plane. Farther from the galactic plane, the stars are older and cooler. Most of the emissions shown here in near-infrared wavelengths come directly from red, low-mass stars. Stars of these types are the most numerous in our galaxy and account for most of the galaxy's mass. There are so many red stars compared to others because more red stars form and because they don't use their fuel as quickly as more massive bluer stars. Red stars burn for as long as 10 billion years compared to only 5 million years for blue stars. From the collective light of the large number of red stars in the galaxy, we can easily pick out the disk and the bulge, the two prominent features in the near-infrared map. The disk of old stars is much thicker than the thin molecular gas layer. Old stars are spread throughout this thick disk. Could it be that the molecular gas layer, out of which new stars form, was thicker in the distant past? Or do stars wander from their birthplaces? I'm gonna tell you what you want to know. I'm gonna tell you what you want to know. Those long waves penetrate Earth's atmosphere. Even if it's cloudy, it's radio clear. Observatory dishes may fall and near. Let it run a machine how do we by combining information from all of these maps, atomic and molecular hydrogen, visible and infrared, we can build a three-dimensional model of the Milky Way galaxy. Observations of the galaxy in visible light told us that the galaxy is flat like a pancake and 1,000 light years thick. It took radio observations to show us that the galaxy is 100,000 light years across. Visible observations helped us pinpoint the center of our galaxy, around which the stars, gas, and dust orbit. But it took near-infrared light to actually see the bulge of cool red stars at the center. Visible light showed us dark holes in the sky. Infrared observations showed us the dust, and radio observations helped astronomers infer that dust was blocking the visible light and causing the sky to look dark. Scientists, using only visible observations, tried in vain for years to show that our Milky Way galaxy had a spiral shape. It took molecular hydrogen observations to see this clearly and trace the spiral arms. With only visible observations from stars within a few thousand light years, astronomers could only determine the relative locations of young and old stars in the solar neighborhood. Infrared light showed that the youngest stars are found in the thin layer of molecular gas in the galactic plane. Older stars are found farther away from this plane. Without the light invisible to our eyes, our Milky Way model was sketchy and incomplete. Now we have filled in the holes. Our observations at various wavelengths have shown us what the Milky Way looks like today. But what did our galaxy look like in the past? And what will our galaxy look like in the future? X-ray images like this one can give us some hints. When massive stars explode, they eject material enriched with heavy elements like carbon and oxygen. The remnants of those explosions, we call them supernovae, appear for a time as discrete bright sources of X-rays. Our map shows them as white splotches. The largest of these are the oldest, having had time to expand and fade a bit. The brightest, tightest spots are the most recent. Supernovae contribute to the formation of other stars. In fact, much of the material that makes up the sun and the planets in the solar system is a hand-me-down from exploded stars of earlier generations. In a sense, 
even people, are composed of second-hand atoms. When we view the distant universe with the Hubble Space Telescope, we see galaxies in many stages of development. Some are disordered, others are colliding, still others are well-defined spirals. Does one of these galaxies resemble the Milky Way as it existed in the past? Does another represent the Milky Way's future? For now, all we can do is wonder and pursue an ever clearer vision of the visible and invisible universe. Ba -do -ba -do. Ba -ba -ba -ba. There's a universe in the radio I'm gonna tell you what you want to know About the universe in the radio has a low frequency corresponding to a deep voice like me. Foot long wavelength, how can that be? It comes from processes having low energy. Radio photon has low frequency cause it has a pretty low energy. There's a lot of cool gas in the Milky Way Neutral hydrogen atoms leading the way When the proton and electron spin decay It sends a really long radio wave no way And we study these photons day after day To map the regions of the galaxy real far away Someone hadn't built a dish and sat below To see the universe unfold in the radio Hey ho, did you know that there's a universe in the radio? I'm gonna tell you what you want to know about the universe in the radio Imagine the wonderful things that we know By observing the sky in the radio